So now what I want to talk about are the last two exercises we did for lab, and that is enzymatic specificity and the cofactors experiment. All right, so let's talk about specificity. Basically what specificity is talking about is, or what we're referring to when we speak about enzymatic specificity is, sorry, how well does the enzyme bind to its substrate, so its specific substrate and only its substrate. In other words, there are a lot of molecules out there, and some of those molecules might actually look similar. They might have similar charges, they might have similar shapes. If we're going to have an enzyme that acts in a particular manner, like lactase, that helps us metabolize lactose, we don't want this enzyme binding to any substrate outside of lactose, because otherwise, all of that time it's binding to a substrate other than lactose, it's not helping us metabolize lactose, and that could lead to lactose intolerance, as it does with people who don't have lactase. Okay? So we want to look at two substrates in this exercise and see which of those two substrates the enzyme binds to more efficiently. Okay? So the two substrates that we analyzed in this particular exercise were lactose and maltose. Okay, now, I'm not going to draw their structures up here because you have them in your lab manual. So consult your lab manual, uh, this is experiment 7.3, and look at how closely these two molecules actually look from a structural standpoint. I think you'll find that they're very, very, very similar. The big difference is that the two monosaccharides that are linked by a glycosidic linkage to make lactose are galactose and glucose. While with maltose, it's two glucose molecules. Okay? So if we were to allow these reactions to proceed without the presence of an enzyme at a regular rate, and let's assume that the metabolism of both of these substances would be equal. So you break down lactose into its two products at the same rate, you break down maltose into its two products at the same rate. In theory, if that were the case, because maltose is composed of two glucose molecules, every time the metabolism occurs for both of these, we should have twice as much glucose in our maltose tube as we do in our lactose tube. Okay? But what we're going to do now is not look at that. We're going to add lactase to each of these tubes. And we're going to ask the question, which one has more glucose? What we hypothesized is that because everything we've read up to this point has suggested that lactase's substrate is lactose, we hypothesized that lactase is going to be very, very, very specific for lactose. Okay? So even though maltose is metabolized into two glucose molecules, and lactose only produces one glucose molecule every time its metabolism occurs. Because lactase is specific for lactose, it is going to bind this substrate much more efficiently than it binds maltose, and it's then going to speed up the metabolism of lactose, which means that even though maltose is in theory producing more glucose molecules every time it's metabolized, lactose is going to be metabolized at a much faster rate than maltose is. So what we expect to see in this exercise, if lactase is specific for lactose, is we expect to see very, very, very high levels of glucose in our lactose tubes and not so high levels of glucose in our maltose tubes. And that's indeed what we saw, which tells us at least suggests and supports the hypothesis that lactase is specific for lactose. Had we seen an equal amount of glucose in both tubes, we could not come to this conclusion. Had this tube had more glucose 
than this two. We could not have come to this conclusion. Okay? Now, maltose has its own enzyme, maltase. And if we did the inverse of this exercise and put maltase in each of these tubes, then we might actually have seen that the maltose tube produced higher levels of glu glucose than the lactose tube did. So that's enzymatic specificity. How well or how specific our enzyme is for its substrate. How efficiently it binds to it and how it recognizes that a molecule that looks very similar to its substrate is actually not its substrate. All right, so that is specificity. The final experiment is by far probably the hardest for students to grasp. Okay, and that is cofactors. Okay, so we're looking at cofactors here. Okay, cofactors are non-protein molecules or ions that assist the enzyme with substrate binding. Okay, so just to give you two examples of ways in which cofactors could potentially exist, let's say that I have an enzyme that looks like this and a substrate that looks like this. Notice that the substrate will not fit perfectly into the active site of the enzyme. Okay? A cofactor in this particular instance could do one of two things. One thing the cofactor could do is it could fill in the missing part of the active site to then allow substrate binding. Okay, so that is one possibility. Another possibility, just erase this. is one where there's a site on the enzyme other than the active site where the cofactor can bind. So the cofactor binds to this site, and in binding to that site, it causes an allosteric change okay? that occurs here at the active site, which then allows our substrate to bind. So the question you should ask yourself is, could either of these two examples have occurred and have had resulted in efficient substrate binding by the enzyme if the cofactor was not present? And the answer is no. Okay, so if we remove the cofactor, we won't get this change. We, we therefore will not have efficient enzyme substrate binding. Okay, so the idea in this experiment is Remove the cofactors and see if you still get enzymatic activity. Okay? How do we test or measure enzymatic activity? We look at the amount of glucose that's being made. All right, so in this exercise, you used two different test tubes. And the cofactors in particular we're interested in looking at are calcium and magnesium. Okay, so calcium and magnesium, metal ions. What we're going to do is we're going to set up two different test tubes, one that's referred to as the control test tube, and one that's called EDTA. EDTA is what's known as a chelating agent. What it will do is if we place it into an environment where there are metal ions, it will actively bind to those metal ions and make them unavailable to our enzyme. So please note that EDTA is not the cofactor. Okay? A lot of students get confused about that. This is not the cofactor. This is a molecule. Okay? It is a substance that will bind to these cofactors and make them unable to be available to lactase. So again, if we remove these, Lactase, in theory, cannot function if it relies upon them for enzyme substrate binding. Okay. So, of these two tubes, which one contains cofactors after we add milk? And when I say contains cofactors, I mean which of these two tubes will have cofactors available to 
the enzyme. Okay, well, in this tube, we just add milk and we add water. In this tube, we add milk and we add EDTA. The EDTA is going to bind to the magnesium and the calcium in the milk, making them unavailable to the lactase. So when we finally add lactase to either of these two tubes, what we find is we have large levels of glucose, high levels of glucose in this tube compared to this tube. And again, this makes sense because the EDTA makes those cofactors, those metal ions, unavailable to the lactase. So lactase cannot efficiently bind lactose in the milk and therefore cannot produce or result in the production of large quantities of glucose. Okay, whereas in this tube, the cofactors in the milk can readily bind lactase, lactase can bind to lactose, and it can speed up the reaction so that we wind up getting larger levels of glucose. Okay? So this concludes the lectures on the enzymatic lab. Okay? In the next series, I will be talking about cellular respiration.